Hello to everyone and happy Human Rights Day. It gives me great pleasure as chair of the International Advisory Council of the Institute of Human Rights and Business, IHRB, to welcome you all to our discussion on financing the just transition, exploring the human rights value add. As a former um, government minister and EU Environment Commissioner, these are issues close to my heart and I salute the work undertaken by Mary Robinson, IHRB's founding chair and current chair of the Elders on climate justice over many years. We will hear from Mary in a few moments. Um, in conversation, we are premiering uh, here that she recently had with Rachel Kite, formerly the UN Special Representative for Sustainable Energy and a former Vice President of the World Bank and International Finance Corporation. First, one or two of my own reflections. The uh, transition from a high carbon to net zero economy will indeed require an industrial revolution, a green revolution. This change needs to be enabled through strong laws, political leadership and business acumen. But it will also need to be financed through direct investments and a commitment to equity, both in projects and companies as a whole, loans, export credit and guarantees, development assistance and uh, all of the other financial levers available, as well as requiring uh, unprecedented levels of public and private finance. It also raises a number of questions. <clears throat> Can we afford such investment as a, a time of, uh, at a time of, of huge government debt due to the economic impact of the COVID pandemic? Is the financial community sufficiently aligned with environmental and social outcomes to rise to the challenge? Do we also need a financial revolution, a mainstreaming of environmental, social <clears throat> and governance criteria with incentive structures that are not just about financial return. Second, um, the just transition concept, which was affirmed by the Paris Agreement um, and uh, is being taken uh, forward by a growing range of actors, <coughs> is premised on the understanding that no environmental revolution is achievable unless it is aligned with international standards protecting the rights of individuals and communities. The transition away from carbon intensive business, together with other factors such as uh, automation, will mean the loss of millions of jobs and the marginalization of uh, workers, unless the rights and concerns of workers and communities are factored in from the start. Transitions that don't include human rights principles and commitments will lead to suffering, resentment, and the inevitable backlash from those left behind. We must also consider the rights of those communities already impacted by the effects of climate change and loss of biodiversity around the world. Already some of the world's poorest people and pathways available uh, for them. I am pleased that uh, IHRB published its background report entitled Just Transitions for All which sets out the human rights cases on these critical issues and in relation to business specifically. So the uh, central question today is straightforward. How do we finance the just transition in ways that help ensure sustainable social and environmental outcomes? Can communities themselves have a greater voice in financial decision making and what new forms of equity can workers and communities take in the livelihoods of the future? These are big questions. And we have Mary and Rachel to get us started, uh, followed by a panel of experts and leaders from the worlds of finance, the environment, worker, workers' rights and human rights to lay out some of the ground that lies before us. If we can get it right, then there are exciting business communities ahead, opportunities ahead, and ways in which the generations to come 
can use their creativity and entrepreneurial skills to shape their world. Um, a few final brief housekeeping points. The session will run for 75 minutes uh, total and we are pleased to have over 500 registrants interested in this uh, discussion. We are recording the discussion on Livestorm, a GDPR uh, friendly platform, and please use the questions tab throughout the event. These are visible to speakers and uh, we will try to answer as many as we can. Don't forget to review the IHRRB's annual Human Rights Day reflection on the top 10 business and human rights issues for the coming year. As we all know personally, 2020 has been incredibly, incredibly tumultuous and raised significant new challenges for business, government and civil society to tackle in 2021 and beyond. So thank you again for joining us uh, today and I look forward to the discussion ahead as we lead up to COP26 in Glasgow next year. So now over to Mary and Rachel. Thank you. Well, it's great to see you, uh, Rachel. Uh, we do interact from time to time. We worked together when you were the envoy of the World Bank on climate and I was the envoy of the UN and then you moved during that time to, to head up the UN's um, sustainable energy. Uh, so you've been heading up a lot of things. Um, what was for you the sort of the best moment of either pre or just after Paris? You know, the, the moment when you felt things might be moving in the right direction. Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Marius. And it's lovely to see you. Um, yeah, we do go all the, all the way back. I, I think I met you as a youth activist when you were the president of Ireland first off, and then <laughs> our careers have intertwined ever since. I think for me, the, there were a number of moments. Um, there were moments when I, when uh, you, it was like the clouds parted and you really saw what was at stake. And I remember traveling once, I think in, in the year before Paris in, in the spring of 2014, just after uh, Typhoon Haiyan had hit, uh, uh, the Philippines and oh, yeah. uh, visiting the devastation there as part of the World Bank Group's response and then flying up to the Arctic to a meeting that had been convened by the Norwegians uh, and sitting in Svalbard, Svalbard and then points north at, uh, at, the, at the research station there um, listening to the ice sort of moaning uh, and really just understanding that this, we were all so deeply connected and, and then I remember in the um, uh, in the fall, just before we arrived in Paris, uh, strenuous, frantic negotiations at the World Bank Group's annual meetings in Lima, trying to get a package together where the multilateral development banks were really going to be putting considerable amounts of money on the table, you know, to help achieve the 100 billion. You know, and here we are, nearly 2020, with the report that's just come out to say that we've still got 21 billion missing, um, but we are in the middle of an energy transition. So. Mm -hmm you know, the sort of really, really, really hard fought diplomatic work on finance, but also these moments when you understood how we were all connected as humans. But that brings me to you, Mary. So you, you, you had all these incredible positions uh, of leadership on human rights at the United Nations following being uh, the president of Ireland and then setting up an extremely important foundation, which really changed the narrative, I think. I mean, you're the first person I heard talking about climate justice. Um, and I remember once when you were the special envoy for Great Lakes in Africa, and you talked about uh, women in villages in, I think in the Eastern Congo, and their chance to be peace builders and peacemakers, but their need to have reliable, clean, affordable electricity. And you put everything together so beautifully. I mean, how did you first come, across the, the, the way of framing climate as a justice issue? Well, I came very late to the climate issue, to be honest. I mean, I served for my uh, four years, sorry, five years as UN High Commissioner, because I did an extra year um, uh, from 1997 to 2002. There was another part of the UN dealing with the climate issue and I was kind of in a silo. I didn't make the connection with human rights. It wasn't until I started working in African countries on economic and social rights um, as an NGO 
we had a little organization called Realizing Rights, which I'd founded. And we were um, trying to do what um, big organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch were doing on civil and political rights. They were holding governments to account. We were saying on economic and social rights, mm -hmm. you've got to work with governments on health, education, and then hold them to account. So it was really very interesting. But I kept hearing this you know, refrain about uh, things are so bad now. And the badness was um, that uh, it, the, the, the changes were so unpredictable. As Constance O'Kellett, a grandmother like me said, um, uh, from Eastern, a village in Eastern Uganda, she said, this is outside our experience. How are we to cope? You know, and then she gradually learned about climate change and became a climate champion, firstly through Oxford and then uh, Oxfam and then um, Climate Wise Women. And it was these voices that to me were so important in helping to bring home the climate justice idea. So now uh, we just had, an, I, I'm based in the United States now, I live in Massachusetts, as you, as you noted, and we just had an election where the candidate who won, uh, or who almost everybody believes uh, won, uh, fought on a platform of racial justice, climate justice, uh, economic justice. Um, how do you think we bring that into real meaning in people's lives? Because rhetorically, I think we've moved forward. I'm not sure we've achieved it yet. Well, I think the idea of climate justice actually helps because I often talk about the five layers of injustice that are behind climate justice. And the first layer is the uh, fact that climate change has disproportionately and much earlier affected the uh, poorest countries, the um, poorest communities, the small island states, the indigenous communities. And these, in fact, are the black and brown and indigenous peoples of our world. So it's also a racial injustice. And then the second layer is the gender dimensions, the different social ro roles of women and men, particularly in the developing world, the lack of land rights, the lack of access to credit, and so on. And yet women have to be resilient and put food on the table and go further in, water, in, the, in drought for water and so on. The third injustice is the intergenerational injustice mm -hmm. that the children have reminded us of. The fourth injustice is a very subtle, but I think really important one, the injustice of the different pathways to development. The developing countries have found more coal, more oil, more gas. They have to take their people out of poverty. If they do, it will hurt them quickest because of the injustice of where they are in the world, but it, it will use up the global, the carbon budget, and none of us will have a safe world or, or a future for our children and grandchildren. And then the fifth layer is the injustice to nature herself. And I was glad you mentioned that moment in the Arctic. I was in Greenland on a scientific expedition last in August 2019, and I sat listening to a glacier um, carving, and mm. I, I cried because mm -hmm. I felt the pressure nature was under. It literally moved me to tears. And that has never happened before. And it was, a, it was a, an important experience. It was like an indigenous bit of wisdom coming into me. You know, mm -hmm. that we, so I really like the concept of just transition, which is essential to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the whole idea of climate justice. And it has been thought about quite narrowly until this good report of the um, Institute for Human Rights and Business. I mean, I, I really like uh, the way that um, there is a much broader sense uh, um, in um, Helena Ward's report um, of uh, the uh, fact that this is that there's a, um, a kind of just transition out of fossil fuel and a just transition into better jobs, et cetera. Recently, I took part in a discussion on uh, another report, which is the people's transition community-led development for climate justice. And that was a, a, even an extension of her uh, thinking and, and a very necessary one because the EU is going to have a climate pact and is going to need communities, but above all else, we're going to need finance. And I think it would be good to hear you on, you've mentioned already that we're not there yet with the 100 billion, but we, we have seen investment in trillions wanting to move, um, mm -hmm. even at the last COP um, saying they want to move, why is more not moving and how do we get it to the local community level that will help um, the real just transition bottom up? So I think that this is this is a great question, right? So at the front end of the transition, at the, at the tip of the spear, things are going very fast and financiers are talking about the warp speed 
at which mm. money is moving from fossil fuels into renewables and it, it, just on energy, but also the interest now in carbon-free uh, multimodal transport systems and everything. And it, it feels like every day there's an announcement by a financier or a central bank or a finance ministry about how they're going to drive the transition forward. And then we've got this very long sort of shaft of the spear, and then we've got people who traditionally get left behind. I'm hoping uh, that COVID, which has spiraled the world now into the broadest and deepest economic recession in sort of economic recorded history. Um, more countries have gone to the IMF for help at the same time than ever before. The levels of indebtedness across uh, middle income and low income countries are unprecedented and rising every day. That in this crisis, we, we can find our way uh, into an opportunity to, to power forward that just transition. And I think two things are in our favor. It's just before COVID hit, the IMF, right, that sort of bastion of economic orthodoxy, had started to say, look, the most corrosive, uh, um, if, if, if the most corrosive element of the way we are organised as society at the moment is a lack of inclusion, so inequality. And they talked meaningfully about how inequality was eroding development and eroding growth and taking opportunities away for success from everybody. So they put inclusion right at the front of the agenda. And then they started to, you know, they were under pressure, but also started to look at decarbonisation. Well, now the only way for us to come back from the situation we're in is to engineer a transition which helps countries decarbonise, but helps them build inclusive uh, economies. And so that means that we have to solve for the debt crisis as well as decarbonisation, which means that and we've found that very difficult to do politically for the, for the last few months. With it. The world has not been able to organize itself with the kind of urgency needed. So hopefully with the change in politics in the United States, with a commitment from Europe, but now big commitments around uh, decarbonization from Eastern Europe, uh, for East Asia, sorry, maybe there's a chance for us to come around the table differently and start to talk about what that means. And that means doing something profound at scale. So that doesn't mean you know, just uh, extending people's uh, repayments by three months uh, at the country level. It means, can we uh, have a repurchasing of African debt by European nations in return for green investment in infrastructure and job rich growth? Does it mean climate for debt swaps? Does it mean a new generation of sovereign performance bonds available to African? So th this is going to be a, a Bretton Woods two moment. You know, we have to lay the table differently uh, so that we're having a different conversation, a different idea of what success looks like. This isn't about austerity and the 1% getting richer and also different people sitting at the table. India and China will have to be there. They're the creditors now along with the West. What would happen if nature had a seat at the table? Would it be different? What if indigenous people were at the table? What if there were more women at the table? So this is our moment to try to engineer that. Um, are we good enough to seize it? That's really the question. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it hasn't been a great time in multilateralism. The elders that I chair have been very concerned that the space has somehow been shrinking for a collaborative multilateralism, which was there for the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Hopefully now with the Biden-Harris administration coming in, we will see a resurgence. But um, just to get back to um, the, uh, you know, the, the climate financing um, mm -hmm. uh, part of it, I mean, um, do we need, uh, you know, you were involved in the IFC performance standards, um, but, you know, how can we uh, create more leverage and um, make ESG more concerned about the S in ESG? So I think there's, so yeah, there's, there's a really interesting debate at the moment about um, the fact that we need more E than just carbon. <clears throat> so we need water, forests, et cetera, and we need to be better at that. Um, and then the, uh, uh, discussion around the S and the G. And, um, you know, I work a little bit on issues around food as, as well as energy and finance. And, you know, there it's a, a question of, you know, a major food conglomerate has to report on its water use and things like that. It doesn't really have to report on whether it's producing products that are killing people and killing the planet. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's a sort of much more multi-stakeholder approach needed to what that ESG looks like. But uh, over and above the ESG, which is sort of, you know, sort of it, it, 
it's sort of underneath the hood of the car. The, the question is really what kind of car are we driving? Uh, and so when it comes to the public climate finance, um, the debate that, and I was very much part of this, right, when I was at the bank and, and IFC was, you know, how much of the multilateral finance and how much of the ODA, the bilateral development finance, is going to support climate positive things and, you know, how do we uh, use that public money to leverage private money right, and private investment in I don't think that that's the conversation, but the conversation shouldn't be, you know, how much of the multilateral development bank's money can get coded as climate finance, either adaptation or mitigation. The question now before the multilateral development banks is everything that they do must be about the transition. They should not be doing anything outside of the boundaries of the transition. Now, transition has to be just and the transition has to be where a country is and where it can go to. So reflecting what it's in energy endowment is, et cetera. But it isn't a question of you know, business as usual and then how much of that can be climate sensitive. The question is, it's not business as usual. And that I think is a real challenge because there's an enormous technical capacity in these multilateral instruments and in bilateral aid agencies, but we can't have a situation where left hand and right hand uh, are, are not sort of uh, in, a, in, a, in a tight just transition handshake uh, and I think that's really a big question and that's where I think uh, local stakeholder pressure um, community led communities can understand what their resilience might look like um, do you get your inspiration still from the local organizing very much so I mean I, I wrote a book on climate justice hope resilience and the fight for a sustainable future 11 stories, nine of them involved women working locally, but also two good men. And, and, and basically, it was all about, you know, community uh, resilience building, which is so important. If we can um, have people have a sense that actually climate action is good for them, they don't have that sense at the moment. So governments have a task, they've got to move forward rapidly, even though they don't have broad consent yet, because people haven't seen that it's good for them. So the sooner we can get it across that this has to be fair, it has to have regard to those most vulnerable, those most likely to be affected. And um, you know, those who um, are um, in a transition out of their jobs, they really have to feel part of the way forward too um, with their communities. And I think you know, uh, that's why I think the idea of a people's transition um, is, is one that I like a lot um, mm -hmm. because it, it, it embraces the whole um, and it's, uh, showing you know the top-down levers that can help a lot, but also the bottom-up sense. This is actually going to be better for me and my family, and we need to get that across. We need, you know, Article Six on broader education. Um, the, the, the the sort of and 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 this needs a kind of intelligent financing. So I hope um, that the European Global Compact that they're talking about, the next stage in the Green Deal, uh, will really be a bottom-up resource, you know, we'll understand that we have to bring people with us. We cannot have um, gilets jaunes movements or, you know, right. resistance because it seemed to be unfair. And these, these movements can be terribly destructive if they get going. So instead, we, we actually need, we need this sense of a people-owned transition movement, which is the way forward now to a more sustainable nature-based future. Uh, yeah, you've always been very uh, clear uh, about the, 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 the solidarity needed between people. And I think that, yeah, if you're, un, you know, the unemployed steel worker in Scunthorpe or the solar home in, uh, system installer in Sierra Leone, you actually have much more in common than our politicians sometimes will imply. And yeah, anything that I think brings, it, it reintroduces the idea of solidarity and that there are win-win-wins here, right? This is not a story uh, of sacrifice. It's a story of, of a change and a shift, especially for those whose carbon footprint has been way outside the boundaries of what is just. Uh, but it, but everybody can survive. Huh? And I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen, um, the impact of having a frontline human rights person at a COP, um, listening to yeah. Hindu Omara Ibrahim, or listening to... Um, uh, uh, Constance O'Collett from Uganda, um, stand up and say, you know, this is what it's like. This is what it means. This is what we're trying to do. And exactly. it, it kind of has a huge impact on the technical 
um, pen pushers <laughs> who tend to be the delegates who you know are only thinking about guarding their paragraph or whatever it might be and and, and having the reality um, the, the shining a light on um, what um, you know frontline defenders are doing and many of them are um, uh, indigenous peoples who have huge indigenous wisdom. Um, I've actually been lucky. I have a podcast, Mothers of Invention, which I think you possibly yeah, know it's of. Great. Do you? Yes, love yeah. it. And what, what we've tried to do, particularly in this series, is to listen to voices of women of the South in the United States, women of the South globally, and, and indigenous peoples. And you know, the guardians of the seeds, uh, the, the, the protectors of the forest, their sense of you know, seven generations as being the short term, you know, yeah. um, it, 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 we, we have so much to learn. You always used to push me very hard when I was the special representative <laughs> on sustainable energy, you know, about the last mile. And we, yes. we started, we started just, you know, the thought, the thoughts experiment, it was, it was more than an experiment in the end, which is that if we treat the last mile as the first mile, then everybody else will get taken care of. And I think that yeah. that is a very important part of what we're up to now. The elders have also been very involved in intergenerational conversations, blogs by young climate activists, et cetera. Um, Shia Bastida is one of my heroines. She's an 18 year old from Mexico studying now in, in the United States. And um, she's uh, so articulate exactly on what you say. And they've learned, you know, from the way that COVID has exacerbated all of these inequalities, mm -hmm. how they are linked, the intersectionality between them. And I think this is important even for the movements around the world that they must coalesce now um, in, in a transition that has to be a people's transition um, uh, to uh, really achieve um, in, in a very short time that frightens a lot of scientists. Um, uh, that, that we actually make that just transition and that it is truly just and fair, both for future generations, but also for the current inequalities that have to be addressed um, importantly. And then um, we, can, we can smile and think this will be a better future. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Rachel, um, for those words recorded a little, little earlier and happy Human Rights Day to you both. We'll be posting the full version of that chat uh, online shortly on, on our platform. Thank you also to Margot uh, sitting in Sweden. Um, Margot, you're there live and um, um, please stay for the, uh, the discussion. I, I'm very pleased to have you as our, as our new chair. Um, I'm John Morrison. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Human Rights and Business and it's a, a great pleasure and privilege to be with you today. Um, several hundred people have signed up and uh, happy Human Rights Day to you all. Um, we, this is the first of a number of webinars we're going to be organizing over the next year in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we'll be looking at different global regions. We'll be working with our colleagues in, in Colombia to look at the Latin American situation, in particular the export of coal from Colombia and the transition away from that. Uh, we'll be doing one on the Arctic, uh, another one uh, with the Bay of Bengal, um, with, our, with our colleagues in Myanmar, but also uh, India and Bangladesh. And we hope also to, to do one focused on Sub-Saharan Africa later in 2021. Um, please join us for those if you can. Um, today, we have a heavy European focus, um, although the issues of finance are global, and I, I do hope that the speakers who are joining me now will both dissect the comments of Rachel and Mary, but, but also think about the wider implications. Uh, we have perspectives of both public and private finance, um, trade unions, and um, climate finance too. Um, after we've had the panel discussion, um, Anita Ramazastri will join me. She is famous to most of you, I think, as a member of the UN's working group on business and human rights, and she'll help join some of the dots and help us think about the way forward. Uh, maybe just two quick things from me, stemming from what Rachel and Mary said. The first is, obviously, there's a huge need for more targeted finance uh, to drive the low, the low carbon economy. Rachel used the metaphor of, of, of the spear, the tip of the spear, spear um, framed around ESG, but now we really have to think about that long shaft behind the tip, which has the rest, the 7 billion people on it, and how do we bring people with us in terms of the transitions needed? Um, 
She, uh, Rachel also said that she believes that the question is not what bits of public and private um, finance need to think about just transition. She thinks that all, it's not a subset of global finance, it is global finance that has to be framed around transition, everything. All forms of public and private finance have to be aligned with it if we're going to be successful. And the question for our panel, for me, one of the questions is, what does justice, what does just bit mean when we think about those forms of finance? And rather than, you know, workers and communities just being passive beneficiaries of investment, how can they be active agents in investment? How can their voices be heard? How can they actually have direct financial equity in some of the investments that are going to be made? And the second point arising is the role of human rights in transition thinking. Um, Mary reform, re referred to the report that Helena Ward wrote for us uh, uh, a month ago, and actually earlier this week, we issued two other papers um, penned by my colleague uh, Margaret Wackenfeld that takes um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and other international standards specifically into the just transition discussion. But I guess the question today, as we think back uh, over the past 72 years, since 1948 and the signing of the Universal Declaration, is what is that added value of framing just transition, not just, just in terms of worker rights, where that, that is central, but within the wider human rights umbrella. So those are sort of my thoughts, but, but I'm gonna turn to my panel in a second. I welcome on stage Sharon Burrow, the um, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Hello, Sharon. Um, Isabel Blanco, lead economist uh, for the green economy um, transition uh, issues at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Isabel, welcome. Nick Robbins, Professor Nick Robbins, Professor in Practice and Sustainable Finance at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics, although he was telling me earlier uh, he doesn't know if it's still there or not <laughs> because of all the COVID restrictions. Um, Carl Oscar Olming is the Head of Sustainable Sustainability Strategy at the Swedish-based bank SEB. Uh, welcome, Carl Oscar. Right, it's great to have all four of you. Yeah, welcome. Sharon, let's get started then. Um, you heard Mary make the case a bit for the wider framing of just transition in human rights terms and not just in ILO core conventions and worker rights. Do you agree that there's a benefit with that? And do you see any dangers for, for, for framing it in that wider way than perhaps uh, the Paris uh, Agreement does? I would never disagree with Mary, John, and happy Human Rights Day indeed. But uh, no, she's absolutely right. You know, you cannot have justice for one group of people and not another. And indeed, for too long, we've seen one group targeted here for a little bit of the action and another group over here. And of course, from our perspective, we've seen the social contract break down for workers, really since hyper-globalisation, which combined to generate inequality, combined to create those dehumanising supply chains that all too often were based on exploitation, low wages, unsafe work, no rule of law, combined to actually constrain a development model so that you didn't get inclusion in formal uh, work. And we've now got 2 billion people on the front lines, many of them, of the climate disasters with no rights, no rule of law, no social protection. And of course, at, in that time, we saw the rape of the environment, which has led us to the, the absolute uh, extremes where planetary boundaries are threatened and we have the climate emergency, the future of our very own extinction. So we would never say that workers' rights, while of course they must be part of the solution, can be addressed at the expense of others. For us, just transition is a very simple set of measures. It's about making sure that where there is displacement of workers, that their pensions are secure or a bridge to pensions are guaranteed, that where there is uh, indeed uh, displacement of younger workers, that redeployment support, skilling support, income support are there to find other jobs, and that there's reinvestment in communities. But the centre of it has to be trust. If there's no trust and there's no rights, because there's no rights and people can't see a secure future, then of course they're going to resist change. And we made it very clear when we fought for just transition, there were no jobs on a dead planet, but the journey that it would take to build jobs on a living planet would be extraordinary. 
And I'd simply say one other thing. Rachel Kite's got it right. And I'm sure that Nick will agree with this because we've been on a journey together around pushing pension funds to actually invest in just transition. But there can be no financing, no financing in the recovery that doesn't actually address jobs, climate friendly jobs, protection of uh, an enhancement and nature based solution. And there are jobs in those, but also indeed due diligence and the, and the investment community now with mandated due diligence in the EU, as well as the UN Treaty on Business and Human Rights. You know, this is about everybody taking responsibility, identifying the violations or the risk of violations, putting in place grievance procedures, and actually affecting where we can together the remedy so that we clean up the corporate model that has brought us to this point. Thank you, Sharon. Um just going to come to you, Nick, in a second. Um, just for the, those of you in the audience, uh, we are live. We're getting some nice questions through. Uh, there's a lot in the chat box as well, but I'm trying to redirect people from chat into questions. So click on the word questions. There'll be a blue line underneath. And please type your questions in. I'll be coming to those shortly. But Nick, um, Sharon's already uh, singled you out here. Um, there's unprecedented levels of sovereign debt at the moment, right, outside of wartime. So some would say, um, isn't it just about trying to build back to where we were as opposed to the so-called building back better? And putting sort of all these social conditions into the environmental need of finance, aren't we just making the mountain higher and higher? So I'd love to hear your perspectives as to why you think just transition is essential and, and, and not just another requirement, if you like, making the, the, the impossible even harder. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much to the AHRB for inviting me and happy Human Rights Day to everyone. I mean, I think one of the really tough lessons that uh, COVID has taught us is obviously how um, broken the economy we had before was, both in terms of the, obviously the, the ecological emergency, but also in terms of rising uh, inequalities, which both of which are holding back our economy and its ability to, to serve people. So I think there's very little desire um, to, to, to go back from an environmental or a social point of view. What I find so striking is uh, within the uh, the finance community, I work primarily with investors, but increasingly with banks on climate change, on just transition. I think you got you got huge commitments now across the financial world around climate change, the drive to net zero, uh, thinking about the physical impacts, and I think you, we have seen growing recognition of the need for just transition as well. Um, the, the importance of this is the principled and right thing to do to respect and apply human rights. It's necessary to build that coalition for change, and it's simply the smart thing to do. So that was all building all the way along and work um, we had done with, with Sharon and the ITUC and the GRI, all building up over, over 160 investors committed to that. What has really changed this year is the brutal impact of, of COVID has highlighted to people that the green economy is going to have to be just as well. Um, that actually there these huge inequalities that have been um, exacerbated um, and that uh, on the positive side, the net zero economy, the, the, client, the, the nature-based economy has huge job creation potential. We know that this economy is going to have much better, uh, uh, much better in terms of job creation, but it also has to be uh, good jobs which actually have, have characteristics of decent work in, in terms of respect for human rights, in terms of uh, wages and conditions, and also in terms of strong community. So I think that's the agenda now. Governments clearly aren't yet living up to that in terms of the recovery packages. We work a lot on, on central banks and they still haven't yet really con connected uh, their commitments on climate change. Um, but I think that's the agenda now. And just maybe, John, a couple of points that you, you introduced about sort of moving from a sort of passive to an active just transition. I think that's exactly right. And one of the things that really um, has excited me in the work on pensions and just transition is pensions are the in a sense, deferred wages of workers. So there's a real link between workers and the just transition through uh, their pensions. And we've seen across the world in different countries, pension funds amongst the most committed to connecting uh, climate action and, uh, and, 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 and just tr transition. And then you also mentioned communities. And I think that's the other piece where you see a lot of enthusiasm now for place-based investment strategies, which both deliver on the green, but also deliver on the, the social justice side. And I think that's going to be a real area of, of innovation and demand as we go forward. Yeah, Rachel mentioned the tip of the spear, and it sounded, you know, that she felt that the, those are the tip, by which I guess she means policymakers, 
kind of get it now, or at least saying the right things, but the, the shaft of the spear has to follow on. I, and I'm about, we're about to go to Isabel and Carl Oscar and, and turn to sort of public and private finance. You kind of look at both. I mean, is it an unfair question to ask you, is it public finance or private finance that's further ahead in terms of just transition thinking? Well, perhaps I think it's, as as we as we've heard, actually, public and private finance come together at the moment in in the in, in the thing called the sovereign bond, which governments obviously assume unprecedented amounts of debt. Sometimes the public, the central banks are buying it, but a lot of institutional investors are buying it. And I think this is the moment to ensure that all sovereign bonds, all issuance, is connected to our, our climate goals, our, our nature-based goals, but also apply standards to ensure that that spending through sovereign bonds uh, co contributes to. Um, Good, good livelihoods and respects uh, human rights. And I think there's some really interesting uh, examples of that. And it, it speaks to this question about the debt crisis, which Rachel uh, talked about as well. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel. Uh, on my line. Uh, there we go. All right, Isabel, hello, welcome to you. Um, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development um, has started looking at just transition, I think, and also um, there's a discussion going on between the multilaterals. I'm really interested to know whether this is financial good sense um, or whether it's also political. I mean, uh, um, was it Mary mentioned the gilets jaunes um, uh, on, on, on the comments we just heard. So if your stakeholders, your shareholders in, in EBRD, how much of this just transition is a political question and how much of it is financial good sense? Thank you, John. And um, I think the answer uh, to the question, at least in the case of the EBRD, is that there is a bit of both. And uh, you, I, I presented to you about a year ago, in the context of one of our EBRD meetings where we invite experts, the Just Transition Initiative that we were shaping back in the day. And that was before COVID, and that was before the European Commission came with its own tra Just Transition mechanism. And Sharon and Nick, for example, have been in some of our uh, COP events in the last two, three years. So in the EBRD, we've been going through this process of uh, thinking about uh, the just transition. Why have we started earlier than others? I think because our region is more carbon intensive than the, the world average and the European average and some of the cocktail of other MDBs. So for us, it was always very evident uh, in some countries outside Europe in particular that um, some regions and countries, they have a lot of assets, stranded assets or soon to be stranded assets uh, uh, loss making assets and they are not being closed because there is not a social justification or they, the governments and the authorities they fear um, not having enough social support for the change. So this is where we are starting thinking about the issue and more generally I think in the EBRD and in the other MDBs there is a growing recognition that the green and the inclusive agenda they have to come together. So to give you an example of the EBRD the Green Agenda has been with us for 10, 15 years. It was not initially in the mandate, I think, and then it was incorporated. The inclusive agenda has grown a lot in the last uh, five, six years. Now, for the next five years, there are three pillars for the EBRD. Green, inequality or equality, and digital. So it's grown up a lot. And the beauty of, of the Just Transition is that it brings um, those uh, two priorities together. And it's very focused. And it allows you to, you know, to really uh, tailor your responses depending on the region where you want to um, uh, to make a, a, an impact. This is the experience of the EBRD, but we know through the work with other MDBs that they are going through the same process within the limits of the, their own uh, mandates, because we are private sector oriented, other people will be in, uh, public sector oriented. So, depending on the mandate, the, the shape will be one or the other, but in both cases, I think there is a recognition that we need to face away the, the stranded assets, to promote the green growth and to give uh, good opportunities to the people who are now reliant on those um, assets in decline and to make them fit for the new jobs that will be created in, in, the, in the region. And very quickly, when you tell me about the financial viability and whether the, there is a financial uh, drive behind, I think there is. For the question I said before, on the one hand, many assets are stranded, yeah. or going to be stranded. And on the other hand, uh, frankly, there are many opportunities in the green economy transition, and there are many, uh, many uh, investments that makes a lot of sense today, renewables and beyond. So even from a financial perspective, for a bank like mine, which looks into financial uh, profitability of investments and so on, it makes a lot of sense to, to invest in, in these things and they make economic profit and they bring a lot of social uh, benefits as well for the community and people. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Karlovska, I'm glad you're back with us. We lost you for a second. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can? I can hear you, yes. Right. From the perspective of a private bank, um, do, do you align yourself with what Isabella, Nick, and Sharon have said? Does it make, I mean, for you, the question of whether it makes financial good sense, I think, is central. But you've also been involved with the EU taxonomy as well. And, and, and we've had a number of questions already around the relationship between mandatory due diligence in the European Union, Sharon already mentioned it, and, and, and sort of climate investment. Um, do you, is that now a pre-requirement um, from, from the perspective of the EU taxonomy? Have we already fused human rights due diligence into this, or is it still a fight ahead? Hmm. Well, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And, and uh, yes, it's correct. I'm, I'm part of the sustainable finance platform in the EU where we have working on the development of the taxonomy. Um, the short question is, I don't think we have fully infused it yet. Uh, but I think there are a lot of things that are now on the way to help us doing that. But if I should take the, the, the private bank's perspective compared to kind of a multilateral bank, a multilateral bank is a little bit more project focused, while a private bank is more kind of a, a relationship focused. At least if I look at my bank, I mean, we've had uh, client relationships for uh, a century and we hope to have those relationships for another century. But to have that, we need to have a stable environment to, to operate within. And that means that we need both a stable economy, a stable, uh, you know, socially stable uh, economies to work within and a planetary stable uh, stability. If we don't have that, we will not be successful. So for us, I think historically, um, at least, uh, well, lending has been, and also equity financing or equity investments have been a little bit short term in the sense that you look a couple of years ahead and, and uh, often a credit cycle is three to five years. What I think we, we are now kind of, the revolution that is happening is that we need to look much longer ahead. Uh, we need to look, you know, 10, 15, even 20 years ahead because we need to think through what is the operating environment we need in the future and how can we make sure that we support that and we understand the risks that we will face also in, in, uh, in a longer perspective to have these clients also in, in the next 100 years. So from that perspective, yes, I think we need to get a kind of a social lens into this. But when I, when I look at what is happening at the moment, I think it's an enormous drive on climate. Uh, less so still on, on biodiversity and water and so on, and making the connection between climate and wealth transition. I don't think we are there yet when I look at all the different initiatives that, that are around. However, just as you said, the taxonomy that is now uh, kind of becoming the, the basis for creating this change within the European Union through the regulatory change, it has three parts. One part is uh, to ensure that we create a common language of what is what is providing a substantial contribution to climate change, climate mitigation or climate adaptation. But at the same time, we cannot do significant harm to other environmental areas. But the last pillar of the taxonomy is also social safeguards. So in order to actually say that you are aligned with the EU taxonomy, you must both fulfill the substantial contribution, you cannot do significant harm to other environmental objectives, and you have to have done your human rights due diligence in order to um, uh, kind of ensure the social safeguards where the UN guiding principles on business and human rights is there. So I think uh, with that part, with the mandatory human rights due diligence that we heard about earlier, we are, we are getting to a point where it, it will be automatically infused if you want to call yourself sustainable which I don't think was really the case before. Okay, thank you, Karloska. Any comments on what, what each of you have said already before I start bringing in the questions? Sharon, you look like you've got something to say. I just wanted to go back to the recovery resilience angle because, again, if you listen to what Nick and our two colleagues have said about investment, if we don't invest in jobs, then people are not going to trust that there's a serious recovery afloat. We've lost 500 million jobs. We've got 2 billion people in the informal economy, about 1.6 of them face destitution every day if they can't earn something. And 75% of the world's people have little or no social protection. 
So if we don't invest in jobs and social protection, the, re the trust and the resilience for the future, whether it's climate shocks, economic shocks, health shocks, is not there. So if you come back to what we're investing in, then we know that those jobs have to be climate friendly jobs. So whether it's private or public banks or governments directly or central banks, whatever it is that is actually driving the, the investment, they have to be invested in all sectors, which will indeed be climate friendly jobs because there's lots of jobs in these areas. I mean, I think the $50 billion energy gap in Africa alone if it was patched up with a mixture of uh, um, renewables and indeed efficiency, could give you 3 million jobs. And so that would drive a lot of hope. And 50 billion, when we've actually spent about 12 trillion already on recovery and we're not even halfway there to give people hope. So every sector, infrastructure, public housing, care, nature-based solutions, agriculture, pick an area. If the investment is driven into these sectors with a climate friendly lens and we're investing in the social base of, of uh, social protection globally for the poorest countries, we've got a chance of meeting both the social and the economic and the environmental demands, even as we rebuild more just economies. Great. I'm going to read a few of the questions out. Please have a look, speakers. Also, I'm being democratic. You can upvote the questions. And so I'm going to leave, read out the ones that have had the most upvotes. Very democratic, it's Human Rights Day, so here we go. Um, Luis Fernando de Angulo from Colombia, from Crier, says, um, how would you factor in access to knowledge and information, aiming to make all stakeholders equal in their preparations to participate in the transition? So it's like a sort of a, a quality of arms and information, really, between all stakeholders. Uh, Mario van der Hlutgarten um, said, how do we... How do you see the role of trade unions in this? Um, and I think uh, Sharon, you've covered that already to some extent, but maybe just, you know, why, why are trade unions so much part of the center of this discussion? Um, Phil, the thing is now people are voting while I'm talking. <laughs> the order's changing, which is, which is fun. Um, Anna Tar Tarrell says, how can we best reconcile the difference in impact frameworks between social and environmental if we are truly to embed and integrate the strategic decision making uh, at the financial level. Uh, Desiree Abraham says, if we're talking about just transitions, asymmetries and power relations need to be addressed, but how can this be carried out in practice at the multilateral, regional and financial level, etc.? cetera? Um, I'll just take a couple more. Um, I'm being very democratic here. Phil Bloomer, resistance is growing to abusive uh, investment in renewables and transition minerals extraction. A fast transition must be fair. And you just bobbed up or down there, Phil, as I was reading out your question. That's the problem. Here we go. You've gone up. That's why. How can we insist finance drives not only co-benefits, but also greater co-ownership to address inequality of wealth and inclusion in terms of human rights? And Helen Russell, last question. Thanks for the event. Uh, thanks to the elders, the World Bank, and, and everybody else here. Um, the role about, you know, would you all back mandatory human rights due diligence, basically, um, uh, as is being advanced in the EU, not just through this taxonomy, but also DD justice? Right. Final round. I'll, I'll take all of you one by one. Respond to what you want. Any final remarks and observations for the way forward? Nick, do you want to go first? I think the, the question has really highlighted the, the value add that human rights can bring to the climate debate, and which is very, very nicely set out in the Just Transitions for All paper. I mean, particularly this question of uh, the right to information um, and also that actually the duty to disclose both climate and social information. Again, if we look at the TCFT, Task Force and Climate Relations Disclosures, there's, there are no people in it. There are no workers, there are communities and so on. So I think that question of sort of of, of right to uh, participation and also the duty to disclose. And I think as Carl Oscar has been saying, there's some promising developments in the EU. The second is that clearly participation um, and social dialogue in, in the workplace, but participation in, in, in communities at different levels is absolutely key. I see real potential for new deliberative mechanisms in my country. Uh, the Climate Assembly uh, has been very, very useful in terms of actually bringing together uh, the wisdom of the crowd and providing some really profound, uh, profound ideas. And then I, I think the question uh, which uh, Phil was asking about, 
looking at the the downside of, of the of the race to so-called green uh, solutions, uh, and that is really about ensuring that there are very strong uh, standards, both on the environmental side uh, and and also on on the social side for for businesses going into those areas. I mean, it's it's something we really need to avoid. Uh, the, the race into biofuels or other areas is going to actually uh, exacerbate environmental problems and potentially lead to human rights uh, abuses. Thank you, Nick. Isabel. Thank you. Um, maybe just to reinforce uh, some of the things Nick said, and I'm thinking about the type of investments uh, multilaterals and my bank in particular would do, and the need to involve the social actors and how this for a multilateral sometimes can be challenging because somehow you rely on, on you know on the structures that are in the places where you are investing and how important it is to involve uh, all stakeholders in some places they will be they, they will be stronger than in others and uh, i think uh, mdvs we have to go the extra mile to make sure that we are uh, creating the dialogue which is needed and consulting with the trade unions, but with the civil society organization and more broadly with society. And there are ways to do so. And I think uh, some of our institutions already have very solid ways and means uh, for consultation that bring these people. And maybe, you know, to bring it a bit uh, one step further, where you present the projects and also involve more actively uh, the people who are going to be affected by a project on, on how the project is shaped. I think this is something that we need to work on in, in the next few years, I could say. Thank you, Isabel, for that. Uh, Carl Oscar? Um, yeah, first of all, I think this is really something that needs to happen really in a symbiosis between government and, and private uh, companies and, and private finance, both when it comes to making sure that finance is directed in, in the right areas, uh, but also when it comes to regulations. Uh, there was one comment here about commercial law that you know companies are forced to make profit today. Yes, actually we need to look at what is actually the, the, the legal requirements on disclosure, but also on, on how you prioritize uh, your shareholders against other stakeholders in the business as well. I think that whole part is a part that we together need to make sure that we get the right kind of regulatory setup. And that is the same um, when it comes to uh, creating a conducive environment, for example, for, um, for this shift, uh, because we don't want to come in a situation where uh, we only know what's going to disappear, but not what's going to be created. And if we don't have the support from government to help these kind of structural shifts, uh, there will be there will be much more problems and resistance. Um, so it needs to come together. Um, then, when it comes to kind of the reporting and information, Nick talked about TCFD uh, task force on climate related financial disclosure. It's a very financially um, financially linked approach, which is great. But we really need to have the other side, and that is what is the impact of actions, not only the financial impact, which finance and business nice likes to look at, but what is the real impact? And here, I think, if we have a common measurement, for example, the EU taxonomy that can at least say what is happening. And here, I just want to say that currently we only have what is green in the taxonomy. But at least now the taxonomy has been, or the platform has been tasked to develop how we can define what is harmful activities and low impact activities so we can get a whole scale of what a company is doing and which activities could be put where. And that, I think, gives us a common language to talk about the impact of businesses. And I think those kind of things are important moving forward as well. <coughs> Thanks very much, Carl Oscar. Final word to you, Sharon. So it's all about trust, John. If you have unions at the table, we've seen the agreements that are around shifting out of fossil fuels. We need many more of them. They need to be faster. But now we need to see many more agreements around jobs and decent work transitioning into indeed the uh, the new areas of employment and particularly through recovery we're seeing magnificent strides in terms of uh, green steel green amount uh, aluminium green cement because even though these industries will exist whether it's good jobs in renewables in heavy industry or in services we need to get those agreements that people can see and then we need to do what carl says and drive the investment so that shared prosperity changes the face of what we're actually seeing about, you know, whether it's shareholders versus stakeholders versus workers' wages, whatever it is, we need to actually show that we can change the economic model. And that's where just transition sits at the heart of all of this. But finally, can I say that, um, you know, we have 40 trillions of, of dollars 
in the in the pension funds, the, the workers' capital invested in the global economy. And we want those changes through the EU taxonomy. We want to see tax, not austerity, actually fund the recovery so people again feel that trust and hope. And we want to see actually, yes, John, mandated due diligence to shift the corporate model. So good luck to you and thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you to, to Nick. Thank you to Isabel. Thank you, Carl Oscar. Happy Human Rights Day to you all. Um, I, and welcome, you. Anita. <laughs> so we'll... Thanks. An Anita, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me as well? Yeah, you're fine. Yes. Welcome. Have you... That's great. For some reason, it says my camera is on, but there's no um, photo, uh, picture. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Anita, we can see you. Okay. Um, so okay, great. That's fine. Well, have you been able to listen in to uh, the discussion? Yes, I have. And uh, I have indeed. Uh, as, as a member of the UN uh, Working Group on Business and Human Rights, um, as well as a former US government employee, as a professor in UN rights, as a member of our advisory, you wear so many hats, Anita. But, you know, 10 year anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights next year. I just wonder where the issue of just transition fits within the work of, of the working group and, and, and the movement more generally. Thanks. Thanks, John. Well, my colleague, Surya Dave, um, based in Hong Kong, is working for us on the climate piece of the guiding principles. And so we'll be issuing under his leadership an information note focusing on climate issues and the guiding principles. So that's just one thing. But, but really, I think, you know, today's discussion highlights that everyone sees these issues as intertwined. But the actual symbiosis, symbiosis that I think one of the prior panelists mentioned, Nick, maybe uh, hasn't yet occurred, right, in terms of frameworks and processes. And so I'm glad that you're tackling this. And, and I think the issues, papers that you've already published and the one, for example, you mentioned by Margaret are very good at laying out the issues. And I think the next challenge is both for the financial sector in, in particular and then for companies is sort of how to create these frameworks that are much better at addressing just transition as a concept. You've got the, I mean, ESG is big in the finance community, as we know now. I know your own work and the work of others trying to get the finance community to align around the UNGPs, all right? And we've, you and me have both also have those conversations with export credit agencies and, and others. Do you see that the just transition concept binds those two discussions uh, and makes life easier for us in mainstreaming human rights? I don't think it makes, yeah, I don't think it makes it easier, John. I just think it's another one of these thorny challenges, right? That the guiding principles for many who are working in ESG historically or working with social, environmental and social frameworks, you know, had processes that were under those umbrellas, but that were sort of about different pieces of that puzzle. So you had environmental and you had social, and to some extent, the practitioners on the ground, right? As you're addressing issues, you're dealing with grievance, of course, you see the interconnection, but the frameworks themselves tended to still be environmental versus social in many of the kinds of questions asked. So I think now the bigger question is, as we've been focusing, and John, of course, you know, IHRB has and others, as we've been pushing so much for human rights due diligence to be a key piece of the S, yeah. now the question is, how do you build that out further to then adapt and encompass environmental issues as part of that, right? And that that is the big challenge. And I think, I just want to say that in listening to the discussion today and what IHRB has done, there are two key areas where I think this is important. So if we embrace the concept of just transition, then as Phil Bloomer said, right, one is about new business models, right? That as we shift and adapt, there'll be new choices we make <clears throat> regarding renewables or other minerals that we need to use. And we just need to make sure that human rights due diligence is applied to those, right? But the shift being good in a, in a larger context doesn't mean that it's good for everybody. The second piece, which your work highlights IHRBs, is this issue of what happens when you leave. And, and so the whole concept of responsible exit, um, which relates to just transition is when you leave, uh, when a company leaves a particular um, market, when it leaves behind a particular operation or business model, and as we shift, then you need to ask a different set of business and human rights questions than we've been asking before. The guiding principles are well up to this, right? Stakeholder engagement as you leave, right, will help you understand the impacts to communities, as you put, pointed out, uh, workers, consumers, everybody, right, of not doing anymore. So the new doing, the new ways of doing, and then the not doing um, and exit are the key challenges, I think, for just transition. And so financial institutions, you know, you know you've been speaking to the EBRD, so the IFIs, DFIs, but commercial and financial institutions, they can be really critical in developing frameworks that take these, these scenarios on board and, and, and ask those questions about what are the impacts of these major shifts 
And then companies can do the same. I mean, the extractors, oil and gas are starting to do that, right? The majors are, are engaged in this, but we do not see this widespread across the board. So it's not that the guiding principles aren't up to it. It's just that until you and other groups have uh, really started to highlight this or the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, we just didn't ask those questions, right? It's just a new intellectual challenge for all of us, right? Is to think about the impacts of what we believe as, is an imperative. So it's more just that we've thought we must move Climate is a big challenge, um, and, and we know that there are big, broad human rights impacts of climate change, but we haven't asked about the impacts of the transition until now. And do you think mandatory human rights due diligence is a prerequisite to this, or, or do you think there's a bigger question? There are bigger questions at stake. Like no, I think mandatory human rights due diligence, especially what we're seeing with respect to the European Union, is an excellent way forward. Right. So, you know, one of the things we're seeing with the ten years of the guiding principles, you know, on the one hand, on, on Human Rights Day, I feel heartened that we have efforts towards the mandatory as opposed to the purely voluntary. Another way of looking at it is to say we've had a decade, decade and to come back and say, you know, we need mandatory means that certain kinds of experiments maybe have not been successful. So we need the mandatory, but what's good about, I think, the EU process, at least the signaling to the market, is this, this idea of, of bringing together the key issues of, of the environment and um, human rights, right? Sort of saying that they are part of and parcel. And, you know, I think we've got to be honest in saying the OECD has, has signaled that for some time, right? Responsible business conduct. Yeah. It's a holistic concept where the environment and human rights sit uh, alongside. And the other issue the working group has talked about for, for a while is corruption, right? These all work together. So over time, the challenge is integrated frameworks. And as a movement, final question, Anita, between now and COP26 in Glasgow next year, what, what, what do we need to achieve? What do we need to prove? Who do we need to talk to to get <laughs> human rights onto the agenda of COP26 in the just transition conversation, but the wider climate justice discussion as well? Yeah, well, I think it is It is about um, making sure that every time we hear that word just transition, um, we also uh, follow it up if we are in the business and human rights tent with those words human rights, right? So they're always really connecting it back and saying this is a challenge for the private sector and for states alike, and it, but that we must uh, encompass human rights in this, right? It's, it's about that larger picture of sustainable development as well. And John, I would just close by saying that as I, you know, reading IHRB's materials on this, I think the big challenge is that, you know, companies will have a certain responsibility in the financial sector that relates much more to episodic decisions, right, around specific investments and specific activities. Very quickly, you do move into that world of economic development, right? As we shift consumption patterns and the way we do things and we trade less across borders to be responsible, there are going to be just tremendous trade-offs, right? Which is that, you know, for many countries, uh, we've been telling them for decades that, you know, the way to grow is to trade and, 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 and to export. And that is very anathema to just transition, right? I mean, the idea is that we're meant to, to sort of localize and do something. So there are thornier, bigger issues, which I don't think are squarely guiding principles issues, right? And I think that's the bigger challenge is to say, when do we turn rights, Then the yeah. guiding principle issues, but are they still human rights issues? Oh, absolutely, they're human rights issues, but that's where I think we fall back into the world of pillar one, right? And it's, it's back to the state. So, so I think that's the challenge is to say, right, companies, financial institutions, you know, you focus on the specifics of the projects, the clients, right, the, the activity, but those larger issues of the biggest impacts, right, fall back to the state. Yeah, that's very clear. Right. Thank you, Anita. I know it's an early morning for you. It's uh, just turning dark here as well as we move into the evening. Um, thank you to all the people that stuck with us during the past hour and a quarter. Um, happy Human Rights Day to you all. Our next one will probably be focused on Colombia and the, and the move away from coal there, um, largely to Europe. Um, that's something our colleagues there have been working on at CREA for the past few years. But we, we are interested in having a series of webinars in other global regions, as I mentioned at the beginning. If any of you have ideas for future discussions on this theme of just transition and human rights, do let us know. You can contact us um, via our website, www.ihrb.org, or follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're also IHRB, sometimes confused with the Irish Horse Racing Board, which is also IHRB. So if you get pictures of race horses, you know you've gone to the wrong website. But otherwise, uh, thanks again, Anita, and um, best wishes to everyone out there, and happy Human Rights Day. Stay safe.